أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين بارئ الخلائق أجمعين فاطر السماوات والأرضين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا أبي القاسم محمد ما صلي على وعلى أهل بيته الأطيبين الأطهرين الهداة المهديين ولعنة الله على أعدائهم إلى قيام يوم الدين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي أما بعد فقد قال الله عز وجل في القرآن المجيد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قد أفلح المؤمنون الذين هم في صلاتهم خاشعون والذين هم عن اللغو مؤرضون والذين هم للزكاة فاعلون صلوا على محمد وآل محمد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته During the first 10 days of Muharram, I was giving a series of majalis in Chicago, and the topic of those majalis was the path of righteousness or salvation according to the teachings of Ahlul Bayt What is the path that we need to follow in order to achieve salvation. And because I feel that this is a very important topic for all of us to discuss, I would like to both summarize and continue that discussion in our two majalis that we are going to be together, inshallah, and there are many other details to that discussion, which inshallah we will have other opportunities to discuss and to examine. But we have to remember that in our teaching of Islam, our religiosity, our identification with Islam, our practice of Islam, our calling ourselves a Muslim. It is not a label or a destination, but it is a journey and it is a process. And so we find that the religion of Islam has been compared in the Quran to a road, a sirat al mustaqim. The word sirat in Arabic is actually related to the word street in English because both of them are derived or related to the Latin word, which indicates a very firm, straight, well-engineered road. If you've studied history, you know that the Romans, they were known for their engineering. Some of their feats of engineering are known somewhat for their beauty, but most of all for their durability. So the saying we have in English, all roads lead to Rome, that is a saying because at one time all roads did lead to Rome. It was the capital of the empire, but most importantly, they had built roads that lasted not just hundreds of years, some of them are still in use or are visible today. And they may be better made in some ways than our modern infrastructure. They must have had a better procurement process and a better quality control process than we are using even today. So this was in the time of the Prophet the best example of a solid, straight, clear path that was known to Arabs and others. Sirah. Otherwise, there are other words in Arabic for a road. Jadda, or Tariq, or Sabil. These are also Arabic words, and many of them are familiar to you and used in Persian or in Urdu as well. But... 
the Qur'an, it uses the word tariq. It uses the word sabi. It uses the word sharia. Sharia also means a path, literally. In particular, a path that leads to water. But when it defines Islam, it says, As-sirat al-mustaqim. The straight, clear, and very solid road that we are going to journey on. So Islam is a journey. And it's not a journey through the jungle, but through that very clear and solid road that has been engineered not by some Roman engineer or a human engineer, but that has been put in place by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the revelation that he gave, first of all, to each and every one of our conscience. And then through our Prophet Muhammad al-Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. As the completion and as the solidification of what our conscience tells us. So there is a dual source of guidance that we have. The conscience tells us that when we have a message coming from Allah, how can we recognize that message? And then the messenger who comes from Allah adds material and information that we cannot know through our own experience. And so if somebody says that I just want to live a good life, I want to just be a good person, I want to make my own mistakes, then that person is like somebody who is trying to clear their own path through the jungle. If there is no paved road, and you have to go from one place to another, then you may have to clear your own path through the jungle. But if there is a snowstorm and the highway is already plowed and cleared and safe, you would be foolish to decide to drive through the unsafe, snow-covered side road just because you want to make your own mistakes. Similarly, when it comes to how to live our life, there is a paved, a clear, a safe, a road that is designed for us to be able to benefit from. And that is what Islam is. So then if I say that, well, I want to make my own mistakes. I want to gain my own experiences. I don't want to benefit from the guidance that is given to me by my religion. It's like there is a clear path and I say I'm going to go through the jungle. I might come to the other end, but I will come much later, much more bruised, much less safe than I would if I had taken that straight path. And we will see throughout the teachings of Islam that this is the essence of what Islam is about. And so today I would like to briefly examine two questions. One is, why do we need religion in order to be a good person? And one is, why do we need the specific teachings of religion that we have in Islam in order to be a good person? And they are related questions. You will see the difference as I explain those questions. But if Islam is a clear path and a straight path, then does any human being with a conscience disagree about what is good? This is a group of Muslims and a group of lovers and followers of Ahlul Bayt salatu wassalam. And if I ask you 10 questions about something, whether it is a good deed or a bad deed, then I'm sure we will have agreement about the vast majority of the possible questions that I could ask. But then if you go to your Christian friends, and then you say, is it good or is it bad to be kind? Is it good or is it bad to be friendly? Is it good or is it bad? And you ask different, maybe even specific scenarios, what should you do in this case? Then their answers will also be, if not identical, 
then very similar on the majority of questions to a Muslim. And if you have a Jewish friend or colleague, and then if you have a colleague who says, I don't believe in God, or I don't believe in religion, or I don't believe in organized religion, do you expect that all of a sudden they are going to come to you and say that if you take innocent little animals and torture them to a cruel death, that is good? No, they don't believe in God. And they know that there are animals within this world that do play with and torture other animals. If any of you have ever had a pet cat, then you know that cats, they will play with and they will let go and injure and then kill and sometimes not even eat other small animals in their environment. Not because they need it for food, but because that is their nature. That's not evil. A person who doesn't believe in God and doesn't believe we have a moral obligation given to us by God, if you tell him, what's wrong with you living like that cat, that's also an existing thing, then they don't need revelation. They don't need Qur'an. They don't need the threat of hell or the temptation of reward in paradise to say no. And if they do, then you have to question their sanity and their humanity. And so the question comes, well, why do we need religion then? If the vast majority of those questions about what is right and what is good are a matter of agreement between atheism and Islam, between Islam and Christianity and Buddhism and even other religions that may not have a name, then why do we need religion? And this is where we have a difficulty in understanding the terminology of the Qur'an in our languages, English and even sometimes Islamic languages. Because this question makes sense in English. I say, why do I need religion? And it might even make sense in the way we use the word deen in modern Arabic or in Persian or in Urdu or in our languages. But it doesn't make sense in the Qur'an. It doesn't make sense in the language of the Qur'an itself. Because what does the word Qur'an mean? What does the word deen mean in the Qur'an? We often translate it religion. Inna deena inda Allahil Islam. So we say the only religion in the eyes of Allah is Islam. But according to Mufassireen, deen does not mean religion in this verse, and Islam does not mean Islam in this verse. So there's only two nouns in this sentence, and both of them are mistranslated. Inna deen does not mean religion. And in the Allah al-Islam, or two substantive nouns that are the subject of this discussion, and Allah means in the eyes of Allah. And Islam is not referring to what we label as Islam. Deen means, sometimes people will correct the translation, they will say way of life. Way of life is an improvement. But it still is not the meaning of the word deen. The reason for that is that a way of life is how you practice in your relationships, in your hobbies, in your work. It's what you do and what you say. So your culture is your way of life. Your customs are your way of life. The habits that you have from society that you might have in your family, that you may have developed within your life, all of those together, traditions, values, expressions, uh, the ways that you carry yourself, they are your way of life. But deed includes religion, it includes way of life, and then it goes deeper than that to the origin of your way of life and your customs. Why do you have certain customs? 
because you have a family and you value the traditions of that family, because you belong to a certain culture and you relate to the expressions, the poetry, the literature, the values of that culture. So because there is an origin in your heart or in your soul, you express yourself in a certain way of life. Deen includes the way of life, but it also includes the origin in terms of why you practice and speak and act in a certain way. And that is why on the Day of Judgment we say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Maliki Yawmid Deen. Maliki Yawmid Deen. If I say Deen is religion, it doesn't make sense. Master of the Day of Religion, is the Day of Judgment the Day of Religion or is religion something that is always there? That's not going to make sense. If I say it's the way of life, Islam is not a religion, Islam is a way of life. If I solve the problem, Allah is master of the day of way of life. Still doesn't solve the problem. But if I say that Allah is the master of the essence and the origin of all that occurs, then Maliki Yawmid Deen makes sense. Because what is the day of judgment? That is the day when all distractions and all these colored glasses that we wear, where we have this idea about what is truth and what is reality, all of that is cleared away. And then, I think that I am Sayyid, I am somebody special. I think that I have a PhD, I am somebody special. I think that I have an education, I am somebody special. I have a good job, I am somebody special. I think that I have a very good resume, I am somebody special. People respect me within society or within family, I am somebody special. I pray and I fast and I do these good deeds, therefore I am somebody special. I am wealthy. These are all of the things that people have to give themselves some sort of self-esteem and sometimes we feel very defensive and very protective about our identity. If you ever have a marriage, and these days in marriages, many times the husband and the wife both work. If the wife starts to earn more than the husband, does it cause some insecurity in many men? Yes. Why? Because part of their self-esteem was due to their paycheck. Not due to their piety or their values, but whenever I feel insecure, because I am a speaker and I give majalis and then somebody comes and recites a better majlis than me. When I find that this causes me some sort of insecurity or some sort of jealousy, what does it mean? It means that part of my identity and part of my self-esteem was based on something that it should not have been based on. The solution is not to say that I hope that that maulana or that speaker, he goes to some other city because if he comes to my city then he's going to compete with me. And then I will look back, and I will have to work harder or up my game. That is a blessing that Allah is telling me that this is a reminder. If you thought that your reputation or your popularity or your money or anything else in the external world is a source of your identity and your self-esteem and what makes you worthwhile as a person, then I'm giving you a reminder, an opportunity to clear away those distractions. You are not better than anybody else because of these exterior things that are defining your life and even your way of life. Because as the Quran says, وَأَنْ insani illa ma sa'a. You are only going to have in the Day of Judgment what you have earned and accomplished through your own effort. Meaning, from your heart and from your essence. Maliki Yawmid Deen If I say that it is the clearing away of distractions, the clearing away of those superficial clouds, even the clearing away of the expressions and the actions that I have done. And it's to the essence. Then it makes sense with Then it makes sense to say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Maliki Yawmid Deen because it is on the Day of Judgment that that essence will become clear. Let me give an example to illustrate what I'm saying. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. 
Let's say that I have been blessed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I can contribute charity to any worthy cause, masjid, religious, social, charitable, and I can give a substantial donation. The kind that in philanthropy in this country might get an article in the paper or a short segment on TV or maybe even recognition from political leaders or societal influencers. I, I can give a multi-million dollar donation to a university or a hospital and that might save many lives, it might do a great deal of good deeds to benefit to different people. And then there is somebody who is not able to do any of that. And their greatest donation that they can give might not be able to even put one child through that college course. It might not even be able to save one patient who is admitted to that hospital. It might not be able to even sponsor one majlis fully if they donate their $15 or their $20 to the masjid. But that's what they can do. And they are sacrificing something from their life in order to be able to give that contribution to a good cause. Because they say to Allah that I want to be a contributor or a giver whatever I'm able to do. As a Muslim, I don't need to ask you which one is more valuable in the eyes of Allah. If that big donation is given sincerely, then it is very valuable in the eyes of Allah. But if it is just given for reputation or for recognition, or for any other purpose, then Allah will say, وَلِلَّهِ خَزَائِنُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ I didn't need your material contribution. He won't say it's a little bit less. What will Allah say? It's nothing. You might have thought that I spent hundreds of thousands of dollars, I built a masjid. Now Allah owes me. And Allah will say, if you built the masjid so that people will say you have now done a good deed, then go get your reward from those people. Don't ask me for that reward. These are hadith. Now we will say that, well, it's a good deed. These philanthropists, these, they're doing good, but it's not as good as if maybe they had been more sincere. That's because we think that without their giving, that goal could not be accomplished. But if Allah is Malik, owner, possessor, of all that exists in this world and in the hereafter. And he can take the wealthiest billionaire and remove their wealth and their power and their kingdom in the blink of an eye. And if he can take the poorest person and make them wealthy in the blink of an eye, then for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it doesn't even have that small value unless the heart and the soul is there. And a small donation, if it's not sincere, then it also doesn't count much. But if it is sincere, then it might be more valuable in the eyes of Allah than many, many thousands or many, many millions that are given without heart. This is what we believe as Muslims, correct? Why? Because deen is not about the outward expression. It is about the origin of why you are doing it. What is your direction and what is your orientation? And the day when everybody will come to see the reality of their actions. And those of us who have fooled ourselves because society thinks I am a good Muslim, therefore I am a good Muslim. Because I have a good reputation, therefore, inshallah, I am doing well. The day when those distractions and those curtains will be removed, that is Yawmuddin. Because Deen is what stands at the origin of your actions. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. And then of course, that origin expresses itself in your words, in your thoughts, in your feelings, and in your actions. So that is also part of deen. But the heart of deen is not religion. The heart of deen is not way of life. The heart of deen is your intention and your niyyah and your feeling of service and devotion to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when you return to Allah and you stand before Allah, that is yawmuddin. Because that is when you will be given the response by Allah based on your intention.
And so if somebody says, why do we need religion? Then what is the answer? You're looking for religion in all the wrong places. When somebody tells me that I don't believe in God, but I believe it's good to help those who are less fortunate, I will say that is God. That is religion. If you believe it is right and it is wrong not to do so, then maybe you don't like the name religion because somebody who was religious offended you. Maybe you don't like the name God. But what is God other than goodness? What is God other than truth? So you believe in God. And don't say that to people who say they don't believe in God because they'll say, who are you to tell me what I believe? But you don't have to tell them what they believe. You can say, I'm not asking you to call it God. What you do, I see it. You can call it whatever you want to call it. Atheism, agnosticism, whatever it is. But what you are saying and what you are believing is exactly what I call God. Because one of the names of God within the Muslim tradition, and this is preserved in all Islamic languages, is that Allah is Haq. We say Haq Ta'ala, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is Haq because Allah is truth. Allah is justice. Allah is Ar-Rahman, the source and the origin of mercy that encompasses all of creation. And so if you believe in mercy, if you believe in truth, if you believe in justice, then you might not call it and recognize it as Allah, but that is Allah. That is religion. That is deen. Sometimes people ask that question that why do I need religion? The answer to that question from the Quran becomes clear. Now if I use the word deen, the same way that in English people use the word religion, then that is a fault of my language, because my language is not Quranic. But the way the Quran uses the word, and maybe tomorrow if we have time I will discuss some other verses, but even that simple Maliki Yawmid Deen is enough. It is when we start looking at our intentions, that is Deen. Goodness, kindness, justice, everything that you do, that is Deen. So that first question is clear. Why do we need religion? Well, religion is the source of all goodness. If you believe in being good, now maybe you don't know what it means to be good, or you think one action is good, and I think another action is good. I think that it's more important to volunteer in your masjid, and you say it's more important to volunteer clearing garbage from public parks so people can relax. That is good. This is good. We can debate about which one is a higher priority. That's not the point. But if you believe in being good and I believe in being good, then that is, from a Muslim perspective, exactly where deen starts. And if you do those things, you will be able to appreciate Islam as well. So study the seerah of the Prophet. There were a sabiqoon who accepted Islam right away. And there were those who came late to Islam. I don't want to mention names of companions, this is now on your job. There were companions who used to drink alcohol, not just in Mecca, but in Medina. Until in the final years of the Prophet's life, when alcohol was conclusively banned, they brought their wine bottles out of their homes, and then they broke those wine bottles in the streets of Medina. And it is said that there, were that much, there was that much alcohol still in the houses of the Muslims that the streets of Medina ran with wine. It would flow in the alleyways. Because until then it had not been prohibited. But does that mean the Prophet said it's all fine whatever you want to do? The Quran, the teachings of the Prophet, the practice of the Prophet had already said that you are to avoid intoxication and alcohol. We pray morning, noon, afternoon, evening and night and in the Tahajjud we pray in the middle of the night. And anytime you are going to do Salat, the Quran had already said many years ago that you cannot do Salat if you have been intoxicated. So Muslims didn't need to wait until the end to know that wine is bad. But some of them were just waiting. Today we have that same thing. Is it haram? Is it really haram? Is it that haram? 
Or is this one of those small things that I can do? Astaghfirullah Rabbi wa atubu ilayh afterwards. So that kind of a philosophy is a minimalist philosophy that people have. And there were times in the time of the Prophet. Those people who drank alcohol until the end, now look at when did they become Muslim in the first place. It would be later on in the teaching of the Prophet. The people who became Muslim right away were those people who had already given up alcohol in jahiliyyah. They didn't need to wait for wahi because they saw this is foolishness for me to consume something that is a waste of my money, that takes away my intellect and my reason, and that makes me say or do something that I might regret in the future. So one of those examples is Ja'far ibn Abi Talib, the brother of Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salatu was salam. Ja'far al-Tayyar as we know him, Ja'far ibn Abi Talib, he was not prohibited from drinking alcohol before the Sharia prohibited it like any other Muslim. But before he became a Muslim, he said, I am not going to engage in something which is going to take away my aql. He was avoiding any kind of gossip or any kind of indecency. He already was giving charity. When Islam came, then for him it was, this is the answer that I was already looking for. Because he had deen, it was just the next step to take the additional guidance of Islam. But for those people who were not like Ja'far al-Tayyar, were not like Ammar ibn Yasir, were not like Abu Dhar, were not like Al-Miqdad, for them, they had to debate. Do I give up my, gas, my alcohol? Do I give up my gambling habit? Do I give up these bad habits? Maybe I'll become Muslim tomorrow. Let me just have one more day of fun. And sometimes Muslims, we have that same kind of a tendency that I don't want to learn. I just want to have fun. So this is because we don't have that strong deen that should come from within. That is going to guide us to the revealed deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that is the first question. Why do we need religion? Well, religion is those parts of your nature that tell you what it is to be a good person. And you can only be a good Muslim if you have that. Before I move on to the second question that I asked, let me just clarify, in Nadina in the Lahil Islam. I said Islam also does not mean the religion of Islam. The reason for that is that when Islam is in the origin of our intention, then the answer of what the deen of Allah is must also come from the origin and not just from the expression. So the expression of Islam. What we know of as the label of Islam, that comes when you say Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah. Is that an act of the tongue or is that an act of the heart? It's the act and the expression of the tongue. Somebody might say it and they don't believe it. And somebody might believe it but they don't say it publicly. By the way, this is what the controversy about Abu Talib salam is. Those Muslims who say that Islam is about what you say publicly with your tongue, they say, we never heard Abu Talib salam publicly say these statements, so we are going to consider him, na'udhu billah, a non-Muslim. But those Muslims who know that the essence of Islam is within the heart, then they look at the life of Abu Talib, the poetry of Abu Talib, the sacrifice of Abu Talib, and they say, you are a fool if you're waiting to hear him say anything else from his tongue. His whole existence and his whole life is already telling you that he is not just a Muslim, but he is the greatest of Muslims. And that was the teaching of Ahlul Bayt alayhi salatu was salam. In a hadith of our sixth Imam, Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq alayhi salatu was salam, he says that if Abu Talib's faith were put on one scale, and the faith of the whole Muslim Ummah were put on another scale, that Abu Talib's faith would be firmer and more weighty because he had faith in the Prophet from childhood, before Bi'tha. And he protected the Prophet, knowing how much he would suffer. 
Now, sometimes if you ask me that will you make this sacrifice for Islam, you're no longer going to be able to be the imam of this masjid. Then I will debate. I can't do as much good deeds if I don't have that ability to communicate with people. And I'll even make it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But in reality, I am worried about my worldly reputation and livelihood. Abu Talib was the undisputed chief and king of Mecca, which was the most important city of Arabia. The one person who was central, not just to the religious life and the political life and the social life, but would secure the trade routes from Syria to Yemen. The empire of Abyssinia and the empire of Rome. This was a worldly position of quite a great deal of power and prestige. Nobody could compare to Abu Talib, Sayyid al batha in his reputation. And even before the Ba'tha of the Prophet, not a debate that what if I lose my job because I wear hijab, what if I lose my position because I'm taking a stand, but losing all of that power, all of that prestige, and then even losing the ability to live life in peace and being exiled from that position of leadership to Shi'ib Abi Talib for three years, which caused his weakness and injury and then caused his death. After the release from Shi'ib Abi Talib, that three years of suffering for Lady Khadija and Abu Talib was the immediate cause of their illness and their death. That is why they both died within a short space of each other within the same year. Because of that supreme suffering. And he did that willingly. And then told his sons that, O oh Ali and O oh Ja'far, when the Prophet goes to sleep, after an hour, I will wake him up and I want you to sleep in his bed so that if somebody was looking and observing and waiting for a time to harm my nephew, I want my sons to sacrifice themselves so the Prophet of Allah is safe. Even in that suffering, that was Abu Talib. Why? Because the reality of Islam is not what you say with your tongue. I can say many things with my tongue for various reasons. To avoid harm or to get benefit. The essence of Islam is within the heart. And so similarly, in deen عِنْدَ اللَّهِ islam Deen starts from the heart and shows itself in your actions. Islam also starts from the heart and shows itself in, its, in your actions. The deen of Allah, meaning your devotion and your worship and the source of all of your actions and intentions, that in the eyes of Allah is only valuable if it is Islam. Which means, not the label of shahadatain or the kalima shahada, but submission to Allah. That whatever comes to me, I will say, Oh Allah, if this is from you, then I will accept it. If I have a conscience, then I will follow my conscience. If I have the guidance given to me by the Qur'an, then I will follow the Qur'an. If I have the teachings given to me by the Prophet, then I will follow the teachings of the Prophet. Whatever comes to me from Allah, Oh Allah, I will accept it and I will affirm it. That is called submission and that is Islam. So, in deen عِنْدَ اللَّهِ islam means the only way or the only uh, intention that is worthy and not just intention but from intention all the way to your actions. The only path that is worthy is the path of submission and acceptance of what Allah has taught. Now, the second question is great. So my conscience is deen. Being a good person is deen. My charity, my mercy, my uh, good ethics when I talk to you, all of that is deen. Why do I need salat? Why do I need salm? Why do I need hajj? And then sometimes most difficult for people, why do I need khums? Why do I need zakat? Why do I need fitra? Why do I need these other additional teachings. Because do you know good people who do not do any of those things? Christians, non-Muslims, non-practicing Muslims who are charitable, who are kind, who are very loving to their family, of course. Do we know people who are Muslim and don't do those good things? Then, again the answer is Yes, there are Muslims who pray, 
but they are stingy. There are Muslims who fast, but they're not charitable. They're not giving with other people who are less fortunate. So if the first step is to say that your conscience and your fitra and your basis of being a good person is part of Islam, the second question is why do you need the additional teachings to also be a Muslim? Why namaz? Why zakat? Why uh, the fasting? Why hajj? Why avoiding gambling? Avoiding all of these haram things? Doing all of the wajibat? All of these extra details, what do they contribute? If you are already a good person. And this is a little bit more of a difficult question, but inshallah with an example, we will try to resolve it in a way that can make it clear for all of us. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said that he has created heavens and earth bilhaq. So khalq samawati wal ard is bilhaq. Meaning the physical world has a spiritual world that is deeper than it and that is behind it. People see history and they see coincidences. But the reality is that history is just a way for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to show people what is right and what is wrong. And so when Allah describes history, He doesn't say, did you find the story interesting? He says, فَاعْتَبِرُوا يَا أُولِي الْأَبْصَارِ Learn a lesson because history is the way that Allah shows you the sunan and the ways in which people's lives and even the lives of societies grow and flourish and then eventually even the strongest meet their end. An empire might last thousands of years or a human life might live, a person may live for decades at the peak of their strength. But then those very powerful people and those very powerful societies of yesterday, eventually they come to an end. Allah th tells us that history and the physical world is not just a place where you learn the laws of gravity and you learn the laws of physics and you learn the laws of biology and the laws of chemistry. All of those physical laws are teaching you certain lessons about the attributes of Allah, the wisdom of Allah the beauty of Allah's creation, the complexity of Allah's creation, the justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as He manages and governs the affairs of all of existence. And so the Qur'an tells us that creation is not just the surface, but beneath the surface there is a purpose, there is a wisdom. And if there is a wisdom, then the question comes, can I as a human being understand the surface just on my own terms? The example I give is agriculture. How many years have human beings been engaged in agriculture? We've been engaged in agriculture for thousands of years. From Anatolia, in the Mediterranean region, in South Asia, for thousands of years, humanity has been engaged in agriculture. And yet, are we still making discoveries and advancements and learning from our mistakes? That maybe we shouldn't have done things this way or we should have done things that way? Have we mastered it? No. The physical world. This is not the spiritual world. This is the physical world. The same thing applies with Science, the same thing applies with our social fields of study. Have we found the perfect political system through experimentation? We tried monarchy, we tried direct democracy, we tried city-states, we tried mercantile empires, we tried republics. Now have we figured it out as human beings? Even this society which is very proud of having a constitution and having a very solid government, many people in this society now, they realize that these institutions are not as strong and as wise and as wonderful as we thought. Because they're being put to a test. So in any human endeavor, 
That's not a bad thing. It's the nature of human studies that there is always going to be criticism and growth and development. That is the physical world. The spiritual world is deeper and even more profound than the material world. So if you as human beings cannot figure out the perfect means of agriculture, if you cannot figure out the perfect means of social organization, if you cannot figure out the perfect means of political organization over thousands of years, when you can get the results of your experiments and your observations right away, then how is it possible for you to understand the depths of the spiritual world when you don't see those results right away? Unlike science and agriculture, you're not going to see those results in some cases until much later in your life and in many cases until the next life. And so you should always say that there needs to be guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because that which is even more complex and even more profound than the physical world, we cannot fully understand it just on the basis of our wisdom and our knowledge. And so, we have to have the guidance that comes from Allah. So two questions we have answered. One is, why do you need religion to be a good person? And the answer is, that religion is what makes you a good person. Anything that you consider good, if it is good, then that is Islam. That is religion. Do not think that religion is something that comes upon a foundation of just humanity. Your humanity is a gift from Allah. And then anything that you as a human being know to be good, that is, in Islamic eyes, what religion is. Religion is not just prayer and fasting. And then if you ask a question of why do I need prayer and fasting in addition to that? Why is it not enough just to be a good person? Then the answer to that question is that you need those additional teachings. Because to be a religious person on a profound level means that you understand the depth of existence and creation. And we don't have access to that except through revelation and guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is why as a Muslim we believe that you need to have a conscience and to follow your conscience or you cannot be a Muslim. And I want to repeat that because believe it or not there are Muslims who don't understand that. They say we're just going to follow the text. Is it haram? Sometimes I'm dealing with my family and I might have a disagreement and I want to get my way and maybe a family elder, an alim, somebody, a friend tells me this is not the right thing to do. And then I'll say, is it haram? Where is it written in the Quran that this is haram? I just want to follow the text. To understand the text, you have to have a conscience. If you just follow the text, then many extremist groups also say that they were following the text. But what they lacked was the conscience and the wisdom to understand when to use one verse and when to use another verse. That is the basic difference between Ahlul Bayt. Not that they have a different Quran from those who were not followers of Ahlul Bayt. Not that they had a different Sharia. But their Sharia was not just a series of texts or ayat. It was a lived example with a human conscience to try to accomplish the purposes that those ayat and those rules give us. So the beginning of Islam is your conscience. But then you need to have the instruction of Allah to understand the details. And that was the other mistake made by the enemies of Ahlul Bayt. They had a principle called Qiyas. Which says that we don't need Wahi, we don't need Ma'asum, we'll figure it out. I will compare that if this is the law of prayer, then I can understand and I can make my own derivation about other laws. So, they said that I will take the beginning 
but then I will stop and I will not follow the revelation that comes from Allah. Both of those are important within the teachings of Ahlul Bayt. You need the origin that comes from your conscience and then you follow your conscience to the teachings that come from Allah and not just from your own guesswork and your own estimation. We don't follow the ijtihad of individuals, but we follow the principles that were given to us by Ahlul Bayt themselves. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Final point and then we will conclude this majlis inshallah, continue the discussion. Yes. Have not solved the physical part, let alone the spiritual part. This is how we see the mercy of Allah. That he says that I will give you examples who have conquered all of the levels of creation. So if you were to come to them with questions of biology, they could answer those questions. And if you were to come to them with questions of history or science or any other field, they could answer those questions. And if they didn't do it, it was either because they didn't have an audience or because they had more important things to teach and to give to us for our learning and for our understanding. That is the belief that we have in Ahlul Bayt. And this is why you cannot have a meaningful religion without a role model who represents that religion. If you just have law, or if you just have scripture, then your religion will always be missing something. Because the point of religion is to connect you to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and to make you a better person than you are today. And that requires you to have a role model that is connected to Allah and can bring you through that journey and that struggle. And that is something that inshallah I will describe in greater detail tomorrow. But today let us just say that Allah has given us that role model in the form of Ahlul Bayt of our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. That each of those role models, they were for us a complete example of a human conscience and of a religious conscience of all levels of Islamic teaching. And that is why when we remember them, we are not remembering a human incident, but we are remembering a story that is the story of existence. It is the story of creation. It is the story of humanity and heavens and earth. And so when we talk about Karbala, we don't say that Imam Hussein suffered, but we say that this is the story of every tragedy and every suffering and every injustice. Because Imam Hussein is the essence of the struggle against evil and oppression. So whatever injustice or whatever tragedy you remember, that is connected to Karbala. Because that spiritual story lies at the heart of any other story that exists within history. And that is why it is not poetry, it is not exaggeration when we say that the heavens and the earth mourned for Imam Hussein. Because the heavens and the earth were created to be manifestations of God's purpose and God's representative and God's wali and God's human representative was Imam Hussein. So that is what we commemorate and what we remember in Karbala. And what was that story? On the day of Ashura, when all of the martyrs had offered their sacrifice, Imam Hussein came and he stood before the enemy and he offered one final chance for them to realize that they were not fighting Imam Hussein. They were not just fighting the family of 12 Imams. They were fighting. They were condemning their own souls to eternal perdition. So Imam our help and will honor us and will assist us for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to keep Islam alive. And it is said that the Imam made that istighatha many times on the day of Ashura. But one of those times was after the Imam had become alone. And that was when 
there was a reply that came from the camp in which Imam Zainul Abideen lie ill. Today, I want to remember the masa'ib of Imam Zainul Abideen in Karbala. And tomorrow I will talk about the masa'ib and the suffering of Imam Zainul Abideen on his own deathbed. Because when we talk about the martyrdom of Imam Zainul Abideen, there are two times that we find the Imam to be martyred. One was when he was poisoned and he was martyred by the terror. How much more difficult it must have been for the Imam when he heard that istighatha of his father, Imam Hussein, and he knew that now the grandson of the Messenger of Allah is standing alone before his enemy and he is surrounded by those people who are thirsty for the blood of Imam Hussein and there is no one to defend and there is no one to come to the assistance that must have been as if there were a thousand swords directed at the soul of Imam Zainul Abideen himself and we see that because history tells us that when the Imam made that final call, Imam Zainul Abideen, in spite of his sickness and in spite of his infirmity, he stirred and he called out and he said, Labbaik, that, O oh, grandson of the Messenger of Allah, if there is no one, then your son Zainul Abideen still lives. The Imam came and he entered into the tent of Imam Zainul Abideen and he says that, Oh my son, I have come to bid you farewell. The Imam said, Father, what were the words that I heard you say just a moment ago? You were calling out as if you were alone. Tell me, Father, what has happened to Muslim ibn Ausajah? What has happened to Habib ibn Madahir? What has happened to all of those heroes who only last night said that if they were able to give their life a thousand times, then they would give their life for the sake of Islam. Where are all of those who dedicated themselves? The Imam said, while well, you were sick, O oh my son, you don't know what has taken place on the battlefield from morning until this afternoon. You don't know how many times your father sent off a beautiful, innocent, sinless soldier to face the enemy. And you don't know that your father has gone 72 times to the battlefield and brought back those injured, mutilated bodies and laid them before the tearful eyes of their mothers and their sisters. You don't know, O Zainul Abideen, how many I have sent to the battlefield and how many I have brought back to the battlefield. But then Imam Zainul Abideen remembered each and every one of his relatives. And he knew from the answer of the Imam what had happened to them. But this was the love of Imam Zainul Abideen that he was expressing. And maybe he was offering consolation to his father that the memory of your heroes is going to be kept alive by Zainul Abideen. He said, Father, what happened to Ali Akbar? What happened to Aul and Muhammad? Where is Qasim? Who until just yesterday I saw so enthusiastically readying himself for battle. Even though he was a child. And then, when the Imam answered, he said that, Oh my dear son, Qasim has been martyred. Allah oh, Muhammad went together, and now their bodies lie together in the tents. And he answered a question that maybe Imam Zain al-Abideen had not even asked. He said, Oh my son, even Ali Asghar has been martyred. And here, Imam Zain al-Abideen would have said, my young six-month-old brother Ali Asghar, even he has been martyred. How did this happen? And the Imam would say, I took him with my own arms before the enemy. That this young innocent child, if you say that I have wronged you, has done nothing wrong, have mercy on him if you do not have mercy on me. And even Ali Asghar closed his eyes to this world. And then Imam Zainul Abideen, he turned to his aunt Zainab and he asked her something which said, sent trivers and sent a very 
painful sensation through the heart of Imam Hussain. He said that, oh my aunt Zainab, if truly all have offered their sacrifice, then find me a sword and find me a staff. And the Imam said, oh my son, you are sick and unable even to sit because of your fever. What are you going to do with a sword? What are you going to do with a staff? The Imam said, no matter how sick I may be, it is not possible that you, the grandson of the Prophet, be alone and I remain alive. Whatever strength Allah gives me, I will defend your life and your honor with my own life. And the Imam said that, O oh Zain al-Abideen, you have a jihad to do. And you have a battle that you are going to fight. Your jihad is going to be even more difficult than the jihad of the heroes of Karbala on the battlefield. Because, O oh Zain al-Abideen, your hands will be tied. Your feet will be bound. There will be a rope around your neck that is going to eat into your flesh. And blood will be flowing from your body. And you will leak to see that your aunts and your sisters and your nephews and nieces are also tied as captives and being paraded in the streets and in the court of Kufa and Sham. And O Zain al-Abideen, there the tyrant will threaten you. There the tyrant will insult you. And in that court, surrounded by thousands who will be mocking you. There, O oh my son, there is where you will do your jihad. And what tells me that that was more difficult than the jihad of Karbala? Imam Zain al-Abideen himself was asked later on in his life, tell me, oh my Imam, what scene of Karbala was the most painful? And maybe the person who asked that question would have thought that it was when he heard of the shahada of his brother Ali Akbar, when he heard of the shahada of his brother Ali Asghar, or when he heard of the martyrdom of his uncle Abbas, or even the martyrdom of his own father. But the Imam did not mention any of those. He mentioned those moments when he was doing his own jihad. He said that if you want to know where my heart was the most pained and where I suffered the most, then it was when I was in Damascus in the court of Yazid and I saw that my aunt Zainab was hiding her own face beneath her hair with her hands bound and the, ta the enemy was taunting us. It was in Asham, Asham, Asham that your Imam suffered the most. Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'oon wa sayya'lamu alladheena thalamu ayyamun qalabi yanqalibun Oh Allah, accept this remembrance of Karbala on our behalf. Count us among the sincere followers of Ahlul Bayt and in particular the followers of the practice and the seerah of Imam Zainul Abideen alayhi salatu wa salam. Oh Allah, we ask you that we have worshipped and we have remembered your message and your religion and our Imams during these days of Muharram. We ask you that keep us on this path of Ahlul Bayt throughout our life and unite us with Ahlul Bayt when we depart this world to our eternal abode. All of our worldly hajat, O oh Allah, you are the one who fulfills needs and answers prayers. You know our needs better than we do. You know our hajat and you know our prayers. Ask, we ask you, O oh Allah, fulfill our prayers, answer our hajat, give us the best of this world, the best of the hereafter. Forgive those of our community who have departed this world to their eternal abode and grant us the intercession of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad and the company of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad for all eternity. Our final prayer and our most important prayer, O oh Allah, the world is filled with suffering. The world is filled with injustice. So many people, they don't even have their dignity and their basic necessities. O oh Allah, we ask you that the prayer which so many desperate human beings have in their hearts for the eradication of evil and the eradication of injustice and the eradication of falsehood. 
We ask you not just because we dislike evil, not just because we wish for material benefit, but because we know that the fulfillment of the prayer for ending of evil means that our Imam will come. Oh Allah, when we remember Imam Hussein, we remember the beginning of the struggle for justice. And when we end our majalis, we pray for the appearance of our Imam so that he can complete that struggle for justice and establish the flag of Islam and the flag of truth in every corner of the world. We ask you, O oh Allah, hasten the appearance of our Imam and count us among his true and his sincere followers. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad.